Welcome to the Armani Talks podcast. I'm your host, Armani Talks. In this podcast, I'm helping you level up your communication skills every Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If this is your first time on the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button right on below, hit that bell notification, and never miss another video again. Today, we're back for Unapologetic Truths, episode 16, with Harsh Strongman and a special guest. Let's start off with Harsh. How's it going? Everything is going well. Today is going to be a very interesting show. Today is the day where Russia has attracted Ukraine, and we have with us someone who lives right in Ukraine. His name is Karl Trabel. I would say he lives in Russia, but I'm not sure whether the invasion will be complete by tomorrow when we publish. So yeah, currently he lives <laughs> either in Russia or Ukraine, Schrodinger's country. Thanks for having me, boys. I appreciate it. So Kyle, well, how's it going? How's life in Russia or Ukraine? <laughs> Life's interesting. Um, I woke up this morning about seven o'clock and some of the air sirens in the center of Kiev were going off. So I packed my stuff, which was fortunately already pretty well packed and kind of moved out a little bit out of the center, at least because I live right in the center of the city. So I moved out and now I'm just kind of chilling in the suburbs and you know, potentially planning my next moves. I had originally just been in the west of Ukraine, but I needed to return to Kiev for some personal reasons. And it was just, yeah, pretty crappy timing overall. Um, <laughs> but we're, it's interesting. We're going to see how it all pans out. I just opened a bottle of whiskey and I'm going to do the show with you boys and try to forget about everything. Yeah, hopefully we could serve as uh, an unwinding session for you, especially with a lot of the things going on. And Harsh actually wrote a tweet for some questions that we should mm -hmm. ask you. So we're getting a lot of live questions right now as well. So anything off limits? Or are you good to answer some questions? I'll dive right in. Um, I saw one that was very political about Ukraine and India, and I just have no idea about any of that. So I'll just say that now. Um, I don't have any comments because I'm not educated at all about it. But other than that, all is fair. Okay, well, the first question, I think this is a very general question, but it'll give a good understanding for some people who may be unaware. Mm -hmm. What do you want us to know about the situation? Because you know how media goes where they'll give you certain information, but you're actually in the battleground right now or in the scene. So what is wait, exactly wait. do you want us to know? Wait, wait, before that question, I think it would be cool for people to know what exactly is happening. So like, can you give us like, what is the situation there currently? And why yeah. is Russia attacking Ukraine? Yeah, so if you rewind about eight years, almost to the day, it was, I believe, February 22nd, basically, Viktor Yanukovych, who was the president of Ukraine at the time, um, basically was ousted of out of the country. He was a pro-Russian president who had signed some deals with Russia that some people were protesting. There was a lot of kids and college students out on the main square in Kiev, and some sniper shot someone, and that kicked off basically him being run out of the country. And then Russia moved into the Crimea area, as well as the separatist republics of um, Donetsk and uh, Luhansk that basically split off and said, we would like to go with Russia. So that has been the entire issue for the last eight years is part of the country wants to go to the east and part of the country wants to go to the west. So that's where it all kind of stems from. This is obviously all picked up greatly in the last few months since around November um, you know, even a broken clock is twice, you know, right twice a day. They're finally right. Russia finally did invade. Uh, but that's basically what it's come to is as Ukraine has become closer and closer to the EU and maybe joining NATO and maybe having their own defense systems and their own offensive systems, Russia has said this is not acceptable and we will react if you try to push further. And they've built up the troops and now they've actually done something with this. So obviously it's a, you know, huge geopolitical conflict but i think that pretty much sums it up in you know a minute or so ah so it's like stuck in like the wrong location yeah it's it just gets pulled on both sides it's the place i mean it's an it's a place with an interesting history right it's always been kind of just at the center of conflict if it's always kind of just been a punching bag unfortunately and a lot of the country you know if you look on a map of ukraine a lot of it was previously poland a lot of it was you know previously russia it's it's just a place that unfortunately has such wonderful people and culture but has truly been just pulled everywhere in its lifetime so yeah it's kind of just stuck in the middle mm. so do you think of it as like north korea south korea or is it a bit different I think it's a bit different because those are very two clear different powers um, with very different philosophies. And I think 
you know, everything in the West, you know, and you guys talk about this too, especially you, Harsh, you know, the degeneracy of the West, you know, why are we encouraging women to sleep with a hundred men and and live this way? And this has just encroached further and further in Europe. If you look at a map of, you know, cities that used to be just so full of so much culture and thin, beautiful girls, you know, looking to get married. And now they all just want to, you know, go to clubs and get drunk and act like degenerates. So that virus has just pushed further and further east. And finally, now there's kind of been a line drawn that says this is where it's, it stops. Hmm. So it's a well, cultural it, thing. I'm so sorry, Arman, I keep interrupting you. No, no, no. I, I was going to actually ask a similar question. In Ukraine right now, what is the culture like? Is it predominantly Russian influenced or western influenced so i would say obviously the further east you go the more russian influenced it is if you go to the west um to like lviv you're gonna find people who are very anti-russian very pro-ukraine they don't speak russian like in that town if you speak russian they're gonna you know give you the stink eye um probably even more so after today so and then if you kind of go east when you get to kiev that was a city that was probably five years ago very much russian speaking and is now i would say you know, leaning to be more Ukrainian speaking. But of course, since this conflict, what's happened is all the Western NGOs and volunteer companies have come in, they put on their little gay pride parades and they say, oh, it's all about diversity. It's all about being woke, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? That doesn't fucking win wars as is clearly going to be shown in the today in the coming days. Um, And then of course, as you go further east, you won't hear any Ukrainian, you'll only hear Russian, the levels of English are worse. And then of course, you go to those actual separatist regions, which are now, you know, a part of Russia, which I've I've never been there, I can't comment too much. Um, But I would assume that those people, you know, I believe after everything in 2014, they were given Russian passports, Russian pensions. So obviously, they were not so opposed to that Russian culture. Interesting. And have you been staying updated with a lot of the coverage or ha- have you yeah, had to TV off? No, nothing in the mainstream. I don't bother with any of that. Um, you know, basically there's a few telegram channels, which pretty much sum it all up and it's without all the bullshit of mainstream media. So I've just been watching those and it's pretty funny because anything that's on the Ukrainian side, any, you know, Russian tank or any tank that's blown up or whatever, it's, oh, you know, the Ukrainians did this to the Russians. And then you flip over to the Russian channel and it's the exact same image, exact same tank. And it's, oh, we defeated a Ukrainian tank. So <laughs> at this point, I don't really know what to believe. All I know is as of now, nothing's dropping out of the sky. People are still kind of going about their lives. Um, and you know what? I'm not seeing any evidence of any of it, right? If they've truly, you know, taken out runways and airports, you know, all, all it is is a bunch of missiles that then you see fire and they're just videos. I don't see anyone on the ground actually reporting anything and showing any proof. I haven't seen an ounce of it yet. So I don't know what's going on in the U S today, but I bet they're covering up something. You know, there's, there's a reason why today is the day I would ask, you know, what are they slamming through the Congress and the house of representatives right now? What's going on? Hmm. Interesting. Do, I think do you have any one, hypothesis as to what it is? I have no idea. Go ahead, Harsh. Did you try booking a flight out of Ukraine? Are you able to do that? No, the airspace is totally shut off and closed. Ah, I see. There's no chance there's of no... that now. If you look at like a flight scanner, you'll see there's like no planes over Ukraine right now at all. Really? So you can't even leave if you wanted to? You can still cross by land, by a uh, car, or by train. That's still a possibility. But as far as a flight, uh, definitely not. No commercial flights at this point. And I personally, I wouldn't really want to get on one anyway. Gotcha. Yeah. And let's How not long? forget, too, what happened in 2014 when this all started. There was a Malaysian Airlines jet that got shot down over the east of Ukraine. I think it was coming from Amsterdam. And that was right after that plane um, MH370 went missing. So, yeah, I'm not too keen to get on a flight personally. <laughs> Are a lot of people keen to get on the trains, though? Is, is it pretty packed over there? Yeah, they're operating as normal. It looks like they're definitely are are crowded, though, Um, at least going to the West. I don't know how long that will continue, but definitely um, I have one friend who is going to a like a village just outside of the capital, probably about 30 miles away, 40 kilometers. 
and it took six hours. And I have another friend who's been in a cab since about 9.30 this morning, and he is going to the west, and there's a village or a city that's about 80 miles away, and he's not even to that yet. So in like eight hours, he's gone barely 80 miles. Wow. So, yeah. You know what? Um, I remember once I was traveling to a very remote part of India a couple of years ago, and a very similar situation happened where there was a lot of traffic on like a thin road. And what happened was a couple of cars run out of fuel, which clogged up the entire place because everyone's mm-hmm. going one way and no one's coming back. So the entire road is completely clogged. And if a, if one or two cars run out, run out of fuel, then the entire way just, is just blocked until someone walks and goes and gets fuel for these cars. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's the other thing too. A lot of the gas stations totally filled right now, you know, kilometer back. So... This reminds me a lot of, I mean, it's probably not the same comparison, but just a similar analogy. I live in Florida, so we often get hit by a lot of hurricanes. And whenever mm-hmm. hurricanes are hitting, I mean, it's kind of similar as in a lot of people are trying to leave by roads and the gas prices are jacked up. There's not enough gases. People are trying to get water, et cetera. So mm-hmm. just to paint the picture, would you say right now the roads are pretty packed or kind of yeah. empty? Okay. Uh, congested. Yeah. In in parts of the city, they are totally empty, far less traffic than usual. But the outroads, like the highways leaving Kiev, are absolutely packed right now. Like I said, you know, I've got a friend who's gone eighty miles in like eight hours, so he's going about ten miles an hour on average in a taxi. I don't even want to know what that bill is going to be when the taxi <laughs> finally gets there. <laughs> Well, one of the questions, uh, Kyle, is um, it's pretty blunt and to the point. Uh, so feel free to answer it if you want. Uh, the question goes like, is it real? Images just show smoke in the sky. Are missiles landing? Will Kyle stay slash go? Uh, his predictions on how this impacts the sovereign man. And I could break the question apart if you need me to repeat anything. I actually have it. I've got it on my iPad right next to me here. So is it real? Uh, you know, I, like I, I just said this a minute ago, right? There's no proof of anything. It's just smoke, right? And some fire and that's easy enough to be edited. So I, I don't know at this point. Um, I have not seen anything with my own eyes that makes me think it's so bad, but I could be wrong. Obviously. Um, will I stay or will I go? I'm holding tight for now because this is kind of the way I look at it, right? You, I always try to do the opposite of what everybody else does. So I could have left earlier. I couldn't. And now that everybody's going, they're all just sitting ducks on the highway. And personally, I would rather, you know, if something's going to happen, I'd rather be in an apartment, you know, surrounded by my girl, my dog and some other good people than be stuck, you know, in a fucking ditch off the side of the highway. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So for now, I'm staying put and playing it by ear for the next couple of days. And then we'll probably at, at that point be looking to to get out at some point. So um, as far hey, as predictions on how, yeah, go ahead. The worst case scenario is that you got a Russian pension, right? <laughs> I don't if think I'm old enough and I have an American passport. <laughs> I don't think they're going to like me much actually, which is a risk. You know, they could look at me and be like, you know, oh, you're a spy or something of the sort. So that is kind of a risk to me as well in the coming weeks. So, Oh, so is that a thing? Could be. I mean, obviously, if they were to interrogate me, they'll see I don't have any state secrets or anything that's useful to them. (laughs) Um, And I would be like, yeah, I'm down to not have any more pride parades. Actually, I support that. So we'll see. Um, That's exactly what a spy would say. (laughs) Uh, It's true. Crap. They'll go through your Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, just give them the Twitter, right? (laughs) I mean, it, it's very sad to me because I, I kind of look at it from both sides, right? This is my home. I obviously feel for the people. I understand why they feel the way they do. But at the same time, I left the West and I see what has been going on. And I, you know, people get brainwashed. So I'm, I don't want to say I'm, I, I see both sides of it. And I think that's what people really can't do is they're unable to put that emotional bias outside and be able to look at the situation with some analytics and see why people might be doing what they are doing. And I think that's unfortunately something that over the last two years, pretty much everybody has shown they lack that skill. And for those people that don't know you, Kyle, I mean, you used to live in the 
U.S., more specifically, like the California area for some time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, born and raised California. Um, went to school there, and then I was working in Los Angeles, and I took my first trip out to Eastern Europe, and I knew it was kind of over for me at that point. I knew I needed to leave California, leave the U.S., and just find something different out here, and that's kind of what I've done since 2016. Been living out here. How long have you been in EE? Uh, since 2016, full time. Oh, six years. Yeah, almost six years now. It'll be six years in April. So, what is it like? What does life look like in Eastern Europe as compared to California or LA? Well, it's see, that's the thing. It's rapidly changed over the last few years. It's become more westernized. Um, but the big difference, obviously, is European cities very walkable. Right, you can walk almost anywhere. If not, there's always a tram or a bus or a metro you can take. Um, it's a very different way of life. Also, the food goes bad significantly quicker. So it's not sprayed with all the preservatives and all the stuff that, you know, inflames you and makes you feel terrible in the States. Um, and well, it's kind of, this has been changing, but earlier the girls were absolutely just very feminine. They really were looking for relationships, um, well-dressed, well-spoken. They've gotten more Western now. And I see some of the young ones in sweatpants and Uggs and, you know, Vans and Converse, Chuck Taylors. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes, but it is just a very different lifestyle and people are more focused, I think on family and, you know, creating family, you know, living with your family and just all the nuclear stuff as opposed to just a, a career or whatever else. Was there that moment when you, you know, visited EE or you had that insight, like, okay, I'm moving here. Or was it just a slow buildup? It was the first night I got to Poland in 2014, bro. <laughs> I was in a club and I met a girl named Polina and just talking to her for like 10 minutes, I just knew I was like, I'm in the wrong place. Just everything <laughs> was so different. One night, one, one club. Yep. That was it. And how'd your uh, family react to it? Cause they're all still in the U S yeah, correct. Um, they've always, you know, I've been very blessed to have some very good parents and they've always been fully supportive of me on that. Um, you know, shocked, obviously, at the time, I had a pretty good job as an engineer. Um, but they have always supported it and have always encouraged me to go after it and have never once, you know, held it against me. And they actually see me even more now because now when they come out here, or when I visit there, it's, it's for several weeks. So they see quite a bit of me um, when those opportunities do arise. But it certainly is tough to be so far away from your direct family. I see. So when you moved to EE or Eastern Europe, did you have a job there or were you just doing online? At the time, my blog was making, I mean, geez, when I first quit, it was making like maybe a grand a month and I had maybe $20,000 saved away, plus like a 401k and some other stuff. But no, I started just building up my original blog, um, you know, and I was selling some courses, I was selling some books, I was doing a bit of affiliate marketing, started building Twitter in the meantime, I got very good at SEO. So then I kind of built a network of niche sites. Um, that were basically just designed purely to sell products off of Amazon or dating affiliates or whatever else. And then after that, I got into e-commerce. I started an olive oil company out of Croatia with a friend of mine. I did that for a while. Um, I still own part of that company. I did e-commerce. And then, yeah, now I do, let's see, what do I do now? I do Twitter, obviously. I do the personal brand. I do crypto trading. And then I also, um, what's the last thing I do? Oh, I run a recruiting agency here in Ukraine. Interesting. So would you say that, you know, this is the only time you can move like all the way across the world and still continue the same business you were doing earlier? What do you mean? In the sense Thanks. that, for example, if you had to say back in 1950, if you moved from California to Ukraine, when the internet was not a thing, it would have been a much more complex thing to do. I wouldn't have even been possible between the language and the, the lack of income. You know, back then, obviously, Harsh, you wouldn't have been able to go, you know, work a job if you didn't speak the language, right? So, yeah, the internet has totally changed the game in that aspect. It would not be possible to do what I did in 1950, probably not even like 1990, to be honest. So do you think the internet in a way, is both a positive and a negative? Because when you say, you know, Western women are whoring now and going to clubs too much and not getting married, is 
in a way a result of the internet because it allows western culture to spread everywhere but it also brings so much prosperity i remember hearing something that the west gave us two things iphones and horse <laughs> <laughs> sounds about right <laughs> It's, you know, that's that's a really good question, man. And it's really quite the double-edged sword simply because you can't, there's always going to be good with bad. It has to have a little polarity to work itself out, right? So, you know, but could we have had the internet and online business without the whoring? I don't know. I mean, I, in a perfect world, of course, we could have been able to, but that's not the world that, you know, we got, didn't get that hand dealt. So it's not how it worked out, but it would have been nice, obviously, if, if the family wasn't ruined so much by the internet. I think that's the saddest part. Yeah, I think it's like uncontrolled internet will kind of reveal some of the most basic instincts in humanity and take away the filter of society, you know? Like, it's our, mm -hmm. it's in our nature to whore. Like, it's in, it's in a woman's nature to whore and it's in a man's nature to fuck as many women as possible. Like, that's mm -hmm. how, you know, we've evolved. And society kind of imposes monogamy on all of us so that we stay productive and, you know, we better and we develop things instead of just, you know, fucking around. So mm -hmm. it's like it takes away that filter that society put on us or like the limitation. But in this case, the rule that was taken away was actually good for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, think that certain but, cultures yeah. like... Islamic cultures are probably more suited to handle the internet's corruption. But eventually, I think everyone is going to end up in the same place. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, the, the cultures where there's more authority are definitely the ones that have kept it all in check better, where the, you know, the man has the authority to say, no, this is okay. No, it's not okay. But that's the kind of the problem in the West, I think, is that one, the men lost all the authority, and we could go for an hour about that, but they lost all the authority. And then just the, the, the consumerism. And, you know, I don't know how it is in India exactly, but I think it's so terrible in the States that people work their whole lives only to get this crappy retirement that they've saved for. And it's not even enough to pay for a nursing home. And then their kids don't take them in. Like, you kick your kids out at 18, and then you don't help your parents when they're 80. It's just such a sad way it's all set up it's a little different in india right harsh where there's a lot of kids who live with their parents up until like their 20s mid 20s 30s oh no in india everyone lives with their parents unless they're broke and need to move out of course this is changing lately because of the western cultural influence but if you can most people want to live with their family it's not seen as something that's like you know in the west if you live with your family you're a loser right well, yeah, I mean, like, if you're past, yeah. like, 25 and you're still living with your parents, people are like, what's wrong? Yeah, but in India, it's the opposite. In India, if you are, say, even if you're very, very well off like me, and you, say, move out of your parents' house, then people look at you as if you are, you know, a traitor. Like, you refuse to, like, care for your family, even though they cared for you all these years. So it's looked at as someone someone who's irresponsible and doesn't care about their family. So it's the cultures are very opposite in a way. Personally, I think the Indian culture of living with your family is better because it keeps you happier and more content. And it makes, you know, your fa your mom and dad, it, you have someone to take care of them, like you yourself are doing that. So it's 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 a better culture and your children will take care of you. And your children actually get to like be around their grandparents. So... I think that the whole culture of your kids, you moving out when you turn 18, 19, 20, 25 or whatever, is not right in the sense that it doesn't work with how humans have evolved. We need company. And when people are alone for too long, they have more problems in their head. They become depressed, anxious, etc. And it's not mm -hmm. good for people as a whole. You know, there are obviously exceptions. But as a society, it's best if people live with their families. Moreover, it's cheaper and more efficient. Yeah, I think that's the big problem in the States, right? Is that you kick your kid out at 18. You say, go take out 100 grand to get your shitty liberal arts degree. And then you make a job that makes 30 grand a year. And then you save, 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 save. And by the end of it, you don't have enough money to even retire comfortably. 
that's I, I think the, the finance man, that's that's a huge part of it, too. And kind of what Armand was saying about at 25, I think it's maybe even a little lower. Like if you go to college and then go have to move back home after it, people start judging you right off the bat. And don't you think? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I actually have this buddy who's 30 and he had to move back with his parents because he was starting a business and his business had a whole bunch of variables where he has to pay a bunch of upfront costs. And mm-hmm. when he moved back, I mean, a lot of people were just like, yo, man, what happened? Like, you good? And you would think that, you know, he was living one of the worst lives ever. Like he was like depressed and sad. But when I was talking to him, I mean, he was getting his meals cooked for him, uh, his laundry done. He was saving so much money on rent. And I thought, whoa, man. I mean, here are people judging you, but like actually talking to you, you're really enjoying this. So Mm -hmm. he was personally enjoying it. And he was 30 at that time. Yeah, people's judgment really doesn't mean anything, you know. Historically, everyone lived with their families. Everyone, like whether you were Chinese, Indian, American, wherever. It's only the industry. So I'll tell you, this is my understanding of how this has played out, okay? So before we had factories, what we would have was farms, right? We would have, everyone was a farmer. And how would that household look like? You would live on the farm, like you would have a small house on the farm itself. All your kids, your wife, your grandparents, everyone would live in the same house. And then you guys would all go and work on the farm in the day. So the kids would see their fathers and mothers working. So it wasn't like the mom was just sitting at home and not working. She was also working in the farm, like my grandmother. So my father used to be a farmer, right? So my grandmother used to work in the farm. Like she would help with like milking the cows and everything. So... It Mm -hmm. wasn't a culture of consumerism because the kids would see how hard their parents worked. Like ever since they were little, like a 10 year old would know that his father and his mother were working so much so that he could be fed. So kids would start working at an early age, like they would help around in the farm. What happened when we had factories or the industrial age? Firstly, a lot of women's work was taken away. So what were women doing, right? They were selling these small things like scarves they would knit a cloth or something make hats or pots or whatever and they would sell these small items which were all automated by factories so women's work was taken away and women essentially became creatures who would just sit in the home and cook and as of men 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 no longer worked in the farm anymore they would go to the factory and work in the factory so the house essentially became a place of consumption where the kids just sit in the house and relax. The father earns enough in the factory. The father comes home and the house is like a place where everyone just sits and consumes and it's not a productive place at all. Today, we have even women who work. So this allows employers... This is a situation where we've doubled the labor force by having women work. But because there's not as much demand for work, we can like pay them less, which is also why like you can work for 60 years and not be able to buy a house or pay for your home or whatever you know like what what did he say senior citizens home Mm -hmm. so this is my understanding of the situation and now as we had say more people working we got in we got into a culture where work people live to work like earlier people worked to live but now people live to work and that's where like you you go to a college and then you don't come back home like for you it's like a big thing like oh i'm moving out now it's a celebration and that's where I think this culture comes from, where to work for the sake of working, even though it's not doesn't make any sense, is what is celebrated. And to not do that is what's shunned. And I'm not entirely against it, but I, I do think that the culture, it's way too much on one side, where you have to be completely independent and empowered and like to depend on your family even a little bit is something that's shamed even though it makes complete sense historically humans have always lived for the tribe and the family has always been around and it was never a situation where everyone in the house was just consuming the house was not a place of consumption you lived with your family and your family was producing goods as it lived that's not the case in the u.s at all (laughs) yeah i mean you nailed it bro what about in Europe, Kyle? I, I know you said that like nowadays there's a lot of Western values that are kind of permeating Europe. But 
is there such thing as a nuclear family? Like, is that an ideal that people set or not really? I think the big difference is that in the West, it's pretty fair, I think, to say that a lot of women, like they hate men and they're kind of raised that way. And now a lot of men have started to hate the modern woman. And that's not the case at all here. Like I was just talking to a girl in the gym yesterday and she said like, oh, I'm kind of getting older. I think the, the newer Ukrainian men are a little bit weaker and I hope that I can have a strong man for me, you know, but it's getting late for me. I'm getting older. So that was kind of a little bit of, she's not quite sure of what's going on, but mm -hmm. it, it's much, people are just closer, right? Like they're, they're certainly not as close as India, I would say, but they're, they're closer than the U S and there's respect for your father, respect for your husband, those kind of things, which I think is really, that's, I think what it comes down to in the West, right? There's so much lack of respect on so many levels. And that's where all the, a lot of the problems come from. Mm. Absolutely. That's one of the things I agree with where you gotta, people don't really care too much about disagreements, but you gotta come at them with respect when you're talking to them. And there are a lot of people that I meet nowadays who are so hostile from the get go, where it's either on social media or in person, where they're coming at you like they've known you your entire life. And mm -hmm. when they try to disagree with you, it's like they're trying to attack your character. And I'm sure, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but when I first met you, I think in 2018, and I'm talking about uh, the virtual getting to know you, there was a moment when you were getting mobbed. Do you recall that moment, 2018? <laughs> I'm not just talking yeah. regular, I'm not just talking regular mobbed. I'm talking like it was going intense. And some of the people that were coming at you were talking to you like they've known you your entire life. Yeah, the well, the original tweet, I can't remember what it was. It was basic stuff like how to be a better woman. But then what I think what really set them off was I tweeted, you know, learning how to make a lasagna is way more useful for a woman than your hundred thousand dollar liberal arts degrees. And I made this whole like lasagna man meme and it was just everywhere. Like lasagnas <laughs> are better than liberal arts. I don't know. That's what it started with. But yeah, no, that was like, I don't know. I, I couldn't keep up with my mentions. It was so much like it would be like 100 mentions a second. I don't know. I don't know how many impressions I did. I can't remember. But I think I gained like almost 5000 email subscribers, like, you know, <laughs> made five figures in sales. I mean, that mob came after me. They, they dug. Yeah, that was not that was ugly, but it was fun. Well, you and Harsh are two of the people I've actually witness turn mob attacks into money it's I, it's fun dude it's so much fun i wish it happened more <laughs> do, I, do i sense do i sense a dual course coming in the near future uh, maybe <laughs> maybe oh man i was even like trying to rile people up recently with the whole ukraine crisis and i tweeted a few times like some really good looking ukrainian girls saying are we gonna let these refugees in and, you know, similar thing, like people are, oh, you can't say that, blah, 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 but it doesn't matter. You can say whatever you want. But no, I mean, trolling them is, trolling is profitable, man. It really is. See, the mob is like a bunch of people who like to type on their keyboard. They have no power. Like, you know, the only power they have is what you give them. So if you start mm -hmm. apologizing and, you know, being like, I'm sorry I said that, then you're screwed because then it will never end. You make fun of them, you make money off of them, and then you're winning. It's a lot like it's a lot like dealing with a woman, you know? Where if yeah, you start I mean, submitting, then you're going to start losing. That's just it. I mean, watching Joe Rogan recently, I, I haven't really kept up with that because there's been a lot of other stuff going on, obviously. But it's there's no point in apologizing because that, mob, that woke mob is never happy, right? It's there's no point in ever backing down. But if you don't apologize, eventually they leave you alone. And is that how your experience has usually gone harsh when you've pissed off them up? Yeah, that's how my experiences have gone. Like you keep pissing them off and then they eventually realize that this is an unyielding person. And there's like, you, you're not going to, it's like waddling ashore. You know, you can't really invade the island. You're just like trying to like shake the waters, but nothing is happening. So you might as well mm -hmm. go and like do something else. Besides, I think a lot of these mobs are just, you know, people just see one tweet and they assume like they know everything about you and they like leave you one negative response and then they go away. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people pile on 
but none of them are like super invest you know emotionally invested in this so they just keep piling on and they all just disappear there's no mm. follow up this is not like an organized army with a mission these are a bunch of idiots on the internet and they think they own you when they don't and they are very mm. disappointed to learn that you fight back and that's it it's the mm. best thing that happens to your business every once in a while because every time i get mobbed my income triples Mm-hmm. Like I make like three, four hundred sale like on the same day. That's it's, the thing, though. It's like for every you know, say ten negative comments. Let's say a hundred negative comments. You know what? There's five people that found it because of the negative comment and are like, "Wait a minute, this guy's onto something," and they become a customer. Maybe it's five percent. Maybe it's ten percent. I don't know what that number is. It varies, obviously. But yeah, you find people are are open to finding you, and that's what helps. Have you guys ever had that moment when? A hardcore hater turned into a fan. Maybe. I don't think so. In my case, <laughs> <laughs> I'm too out there. No, I don't think so. I don't know. I had like one person who actually was like a politicianish, and earlier they were like hating on me online, but then they like DM'd me to apologize, saying that yeah, now that they've thought about it, it kind of makes sense, and now they follow me. So that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Like it was a girl who thought I was like a misogynist. It was like a lady, I mean, not a girl. And she is like a minister here in India. So earlier she was like, this, this is a misogynistic account. But later she messaged me, messages me saying that, okay, I, I re- I've reconsidered my thoughts, which was very surprising to me. Women don't usually do that. So I appreciated that. Have you ever heard, Carl, like all publicity is good publicity? Yeah, I think I tend to agree with that in most cases. I think sometimes it it can vary, but I think in our cases, like with personal brands, there's almost no bad publicity at all. Um, everything is can be funneled into a sale in some way or another. True. What about you, Arman? I think you have a more um, whitewashed brand in a sense. What, what's the right word for it? Not politically incorrect. Yeah, I would say a lot of the concepts that the Armani Talks brand covers are more universal, like topics like public speaking, social skills, etc. I mean, these are topics that were relevant 10,000 years ago. It's going to be relevant 10,000 years from now. So if you hate on the Armani Talks brand, then you know you may want to look in the mirror because I'm not over here. I'm not like a political brand by any means. However, I mean, every now and then, like I'll have an opinion that uh, gets someone riled up. And one opinion that I'm like very like for is that I judge people based off of how they walk. If you walk super slow, you're dragging your feet, I'm probably not going to do business with you or I'm not going to trust you too much because your walk pace determines your vision. As someone with a big vision isn't over here taking forever to walk. And I think to this day, that was my most controversial tweet where a bunch of people were like over here, I think, quote, retweeting it, uh, DMing me and being like, man, what if the guy has an injury? I'm like, well, duh, duh, duh. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I don't mean for people that have an injury. I'm talking about a fully functioning uh, person who's over here walking like they have no place to go. And it's not just the walk pace. It's like the entire body language. If you're slouching, a chin drooping down, looking at the floor, that's going to affect your mentality. But I would say to this day, uh, that was the most controversial tweet that the Armani Talks brand has. Other than that, I mean, every now and then I do get like, like the Armani Talks brand is geared for victor mentality people who want to improve, level up. It's completely against the victim mindset. And I think there was this one person who discovered the level of mentality book, um, which is currently available on Amazon. And the first couple of chapters talks about how important accountability is. And I don't know how this lady found the book, but she was just like, well, what if we're a victim? Like, uh, we're a victim of the circumstance, then accountability isn't the right thing. And I was like, look, sweetheart, you definitely have the wrong brand if that's your philosophy. So to answer your question, Harsh, I mean, I don't think the Armani Talks brand is political or divisive. It's one of the brands, a rare few brands that talks about unity, but there are certain parts that's going to you know, polarize people. Hmm. But well, overall, like, they're a very in, in, it's a very inclusive brand in a way. For example, with LMM, and I would say even with Carl, it tends to exclude a certain section of society that we consider are complete losers or 
you know, like left. Oh, just say it. In our inferiors. Say it. Our inferiors. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. I, I would say that Armani Tux brand in many ways is like the very different from the Cal Trouble and the Life Math Money brand, which makes these conversations even more fun because we tackle issues from completely different perspectives. Where I think my audience is 50 50 men and women. Last time I checked, don't quote me on that, but I believe I'm a 50 50 account where I think you guys have much more a different philosophy, a different audience base as well. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I get along with you guys because I always enjoyed how you guys are able to, you know, stand for your beliefs. I don't think you guys are just one of those accounts that tries to be controversial for the sake of it. You guys have a lot of logical points behind what you're making. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of this is what really drives me nuts just in my day to day life as well as with my brand, though, is that people are unable to detach that emotion. And you know what? Sometimes when you can see both sides, you end up pissing a lot of people off. Like this current conflict is a very good example of that. It's like, okay, I can look at Russia and be like, well, I understand why he wants to defend his borders. Like that makes sense. But that that's a very controversial opinion now. Now, am I saying that he's a good guy for invading and for, you know, killing people? No, but sometimes... Uh, sometimes people do bad things in defense, right? And I think most people are just un- incapable of these kind of thoughts where they can just put all the bias aside, just like with COVID, right? Like, hey, yeah, some grandmas might die if we go outside. That's going to happen. But you know what? People die every day and we're going to ruin the future for the youth instead of, you know, and to save the old. And that doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't at all. So yeah, I think Harsh would agree with me. You know, controversial opinions these days. It's not hard to have a controversial opinion at all. You know, these I agree agree with you completely. I think that these days, any opinion that makes sense is controversial, and only crazy ass leftist opinions are not controversial. Like they've made it such that unless you're a leftist, everything that you're going to say is going to be controversial. So, mm-hmm. for example, if you say there are 2,000 genders, that is not controversial at all. Like, that is, like, accepted thought in a way. That no one is going to attack you for that too much. But if you say there are only two genders, now that is controversial. So anything mm-hmm. that makes sense is controversial nowadays, which kind of tells you how much control on the narrative, you know, a certain group of people have. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just the crazy thing is it's the people who are like, oh, yeah, you know, pedophiles for example it's a it's a preference or whatever their current rhetoric is it's like the the insanity the left goes to is it's so illogical and yet people just lap it up because people are not capable of thinking for themselves it's just whatever What's they're a told pedophile? As someone who likes to have sex with like children which is what the west is trying to normalize now. like like what age because 17 18 uh, or like uh they, they talk time. more like Eight to thirteen. Like yeah. Thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is that is not okay. That is not okay. It's sick. Yeah, it's sick. Yeah, that is way that is not okay. Way too much. Yeah. No, but that's that's normal here now. That's a preference, or you know, they can't help it, whatever, you know. Wait, so they're having sex with like eight year olds? They're trying to make it so that those people are not punished as harshly and they are trying to normalize that. Yes, that is a thing in the West. Where and it's 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 apparent by the policies they pass, right? Where they say, "Oh, a man who one day says I'm a woman can go use the bathroom." So a forty year old man who says, "You know what? Today I feel like a woman can go in the bathroom with your eight year old daughter." Hey, I'm not that's... entirely opposed to that, Kyle. I think that's a good thing. Like, if there's a long line for the washroom, you can just say, "I'm a woman," and use the other one. <laughs> You know, I was just at the mall the other day and I was walking by the woman's toilet and there, there must have been like a hundred of them outside that. And you know what? I said, you know, it's it's tough being a man, making the decisions, you know, being in charge. But you know what? I will take that over this. And <laughs> there's something that it's a lot better to be a man. That's for sure. Oh, you can always switch to men when, it, like, when it's convenient, you know. For example, if you it's were very... say, in a divorce, you could claim mm-hmm. to be the mother. Like, I am the woman. So I should get half the money. Have you tried that? Someone should try no, that. Someone should some, try some that. Some listener <laughs> should try that. Yeah, please do it. 
Well, but like Harsh and Armand, have you guys seen the, what's her name? The swimmer, Leah something. You don't know what I'm talking about. The, the college swimmer. I think she's going to Harvard. It's going to Harvard, not she, sorry. And it's a man or boy who used to be a boy who's now saying he's a woman and he's like shattering every record. Nice. I mean, it's. <laughs> I mean, we're superior women, you know. Like that's how it is. Like we make better women yeah. than women. Like, what does that tell us about men? Well, well oh. speaking of sp- speaking of the like the sports issue, I mean, this is going to be a hot topic, and I even see in this situation a lot of just liberal women are like, "Hmm, we're even we're even kind of doubtful of this entire process," because. If a man or anyone with male genetics can play in a women's sport, depending on the sport, I mean, they're not only going to win by a little bit, they could shatter records. I'm talking about, let's say, soccer or uh, fighting, something like that. So I don't know how much they're going to push this issue, but there are certain things you got to draw the line on. Well, let me illustrate a good point of that, because I played in college, um, if you're not familiar with basketball, basically there's 64 teams that make the final playoffs in college, right? And so they would recruit random guys that they found playing at the gym to practice against those women. And I was recruited to that team. So basically, you know, a few times a week, I'd go to the the practice gym and me and a bunch of guys who didn't know each other, who all just played like in high school, would play against the women. And they made the final eight that year. And a few of them got drafted to the WNBA. And you know what? We would slaughter them. Really? yeah and it was we would just show up we didn't know each other we'd be like hey yeah you you and you like we'd like you to play we'll give you a free pair of shoes and we would show up and we would slaughter them yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was a but, joke you know i honestly i could probably come close to making the WNBA if it came to it if i was like younger and really practicing all the time i i could probably come close you know what I think, Carl? I think it's all a distraction from like more real issues, like the whole transgender sports and all of this thing. It's just supposed to like keep people busy arguing between themselves, so that people who are not so you know stupid to like waste their time on these things can actually take control of the country and their resources. Mm-hmm. It's a lot like the way I think is that even the whole whoring thing is promoted for the same reason, in my opinion. It just keeps people busy with these interpersonal affairs. So they are less of a threat and not really competitors to the people in power. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I mean, that's why in some ways, I mean, I think discrimination in certain parts are good. Don't discriminate someone on what they can't control, like their skin color, but discriminate someone on the media that they consume. I mean, if you're seeing someone that is consistently consuming propaganda, junk, and all of that nonsense, I mean, it's just going to be a matter of time before they turn on you. And I think, Harsh, we actually talked about this in one of our past episodes. I don't know if you recall, I think it was like episode three or four, where there was this girl that was consuming so much content that was bashing men. Uh, so this is just a quick little recap, Kyle. Uh, she was consuming so much content that was bashing men that for like five to seven years, she began to despise her dad and her dad had no clue what was going on because uh, the the daughter was kind of looking at her dad like, you know, you always took advantage of mom and even me. Uh, you're just not a good person. But for some reason, she started to watch this one, I would say, red pill content creator. And she just kept exposing the videos uh, over and over again. At first, she hated the content. She's like, this guy is so misogynistic. He's not a good person at all. But I would say like 20 videos in, one day, it's like she just unlearned all that junk from the five years before. And this was when apparently her dad was really sick. So she was able to like make it right with her dad before he passed away. But just think of it like that, like five years of you just being completely under the spell, right? And it's like, you got to kind of, start judging people based off of the con- content that they consume because they could have a good heart, but if they're filling their mind with junk, eventually they're going to do something uh, to backstab you, especially if you're leveling up or trying to pursue anything that's great. 
I mean, I think that's the problem, though, is that most people have such a low IQ, they're very susceptible to it. And then yes. they're also not capable of thinking outside of that that line, right? I mean, that's that's why we are where we are in the world now is because people are just so plugged in and so stuck on consuming that they're not able to have critical thought in any way. If it, if it falls outside of their safe space, then they're triggered and they need a safe space and they want to save the dolphins and they want to take their cold showers and write their gratitude journals. And, you know, that's just how it is. Have you had a falling out with any like family member, close friend, just because of different beliefs? Like, did it get pretty hostile? Um, I think my sister and I don't really have the same beliefs and we don't get along, but we haven't fallen out and it's not a, a bad relationship, I would say. But for the most part, man, I've, when I moved to Europe, I just kind of left a lot of the family behind, right? I keep in touch with my parents and my grandma and my grandma and my sister to an extent, but the aunts, uncles, cousins, I mean, no, not at all. Cause they're, you know, they went out and got their shots and they got their boosters and they believe in socialism. And I'm just so against, I don't bother with them anymore. Um, but there's no need to, I just, I see them so little and I, I have such a little relation to them that there's not even a need to have falling out. I'm just here. And they're there. Did they ever read your blog when you were blogging a lot? <laughs> I had a few <laughs> girls I was dating who found it. Um, I don't think my, my parents know it, but I don't think they've ever looked at it in serious depth. Um, I think my sister probably has too, but I don't really even care. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. At what age did you guys learn to just agree with people instead of trying to correct them? Because, you know, the topic we're talking about that is, you know, people find out that you don't think the same way as they do or even, even in line with the mainstream. People do get a bit suspicious and mad. So at what age did you learn that it's best to just smile and agree with them and they just, you know, t portray as if you think the same way as they do? I don't think I've learned that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me, I know, I know exactly what you're asking, Arsh. You're just like, when did you learn to stop arguing with people? And yeah. I would say it, it was around 2016, 2017 where I saw sane people getting into these heated political debates about, you know, Clinton, Trump, all the Spygate, all this stuff. And I'm like, bro, I'm too busy, like, building, like, these businesses, working on myself, which isn't really selfish. It's like I'm doing this for other people as well to, you know, help them out. And at that point, I'm just like, you not only are you the average of your friends, you're also the average of the conversations you repetitively have. So I'm like, I'm not going to be having these conversations with these people. So, I mean, for me, it was 2017, Harsh, where I was just like, I'm seeing this fever pitch in terms of how sensationalist the mainstream media has gotten. And I'm not going to participate in this game. So you never had that, Kyle, where, I mean, people are just trying to like weasel you into a debate and you're just like, yeah, nah, fuck I'm it. Not, not interested. <laughs> um, it kind of depends, right? I think with people like my friends and people I respect, I always actually am down to go for a good debate. But like on the internet now, when someone leaves a comment that disagrees, like, do I bother engaging with them? No. So I would say I, I've learned that lesson on the internet. I don't bother with any of it, especially someone who's, you know, anonymous or has 10 followers. Like there's certainly no point, but yeah, I would, hey, come I would on. deny that. <laughs> Stop taking shots at me, Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Wait, Kyle, at any point, were you anonymous? Yeah, I was actually until, uh -huh. oh, when was it? For, from 2013, when I kind of started writing just as a hobby, and then it kind of became a business in 2014. And then when I quit corporate, then I did put my face out there. And that was mostly because I just didn't want it hanging over my head. And at the time, that was like a real serious thing. You're, you know, are you going to be anonymous or, you know, show your true self, getting doxxed? I think that's kind of died off a little bit in the last few years just because everyone's so hysterical and worked up about everything that they just move on. But at the time, it was like a real concern. And I just decided to go all in. And I think that was part of it was that I did not want to go back to a corporate job. And it was just one more way where I was like, I have to make it so I can't get hired again. And so I think that was part of the reason why I actually did that. Mm, so you took away the safety net. 
I did, but I don't know how it would go now if I tried to get hired. Like, I, I have no idea. I haven't tried to get a job, obviously, in quite a few years. Um, but if I tried to start applying for jobs, would they figure it out and get turned away? Probably not, actually. I have a feeling they'd look the other way if they even found it. But if someone like at the company were to find it and then dox me and report it, then I probably would get in trouble. That's kind of the way I look at it. I think it depends. You know, if you like try to get a job at these, you know, multinational conglomerates, which are super leftist lately, then mm. it's going to be difficult. Mm-hmm. But at a regular business, not really. Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think, yeah, the multi-conglomerates, no way. But a lot of the small businesses in the Western world with all the free stuff they've been handing out, they're desperate. They need help no matter what. So I, it's like beggars can't be choosers at this point. What's the employment situation like in the U.S. right now, Arman? Vacancies, but no one wants to work. Well, there was this record as of late where tons and tons of, you know, I would say people in their 20s to 30s quit their jobs. So one thing that I've noticed more recently, Harsh, is that people are starting their own businesses of some sort. I do think there are, you know, job opportunities. It's just that tons of people are quitting nowadays. And this is another discussion I had with my buddy recently. I noticed a lot of people that are working, they do it with a very negative attitude nowadays. Or like, I recall in 2007, when you're basically going to a lot of these different services, there was a level of professionalism that was instilled. While nowadays, a lot of services that I go to, people are very rude and they have the wrong tone. So I think a lot of people are just fed up with working. You can just tell like as soon as they clock in, they have that attitude like, okay, I'm ready to clock out. Hmm. What do you feel about that? What do you think? Is that a good thing, bad thing? I think it's a bad thing, but I think it's a thing that's kind of making them think, huh, I want to work for myself or I want to at least have a side hustle. People from, I would say like two to three years ago, who had like zero entrepreneurial spirit that I knew, nowadays want to do something more entrepreneurial. There was this one guy that I knew, he's very low key, doesn't talk too much. And he's like, you know, I'm thinking about starting a Twitch channel. And he's like, I want you to coach me on uh, just uh, how to speak to the uh, camera. He's amazing in video games, but he's just such a low key kind of guy who even at this point is trying to start a side hustle. So I think a lot of people have this negative attitude towards their work now because they really don't want to be there. But my thing is, if you don't want to be there at all and you're going to have to work for a significant part of your life, why not try to at least incorporate something that you enjoy? So I see more people having a side hustle. Do you think that it's because of the fact that real wage, real wages are declining in the sense that in the 1980s, you could like work a regular job and feed a family of four and have a house. But now a regular job, you will struggle to pay your own bills, much less a family. I think I it's do. double-edged. I think there's a lot of people that have gotten a lot of free money from loans. And I think the internet's definitely also encouraged a lot of people about being an entrepreneur. That's my two cents. But I think Armand, you were about to say something too there. So go ahead. Well, I think, I mean, exactly what you were going to say. I think more people are just not happy because with the amount that they're making, they just are, they're just being forced to buy a lot of different things. I mean, consumerism is at an all-time high. You get one iPhone and another two models immediately come out. And it's just just like a rat race right now uh, in terms of purchasing. And I think more people just want some way to become wealthy. They just don't know how to articulate it at the moment. I was with this couple recently, and she, she, the wife, uh, she's a stay-at-home wife. Um, she was just talking about how amazing would it be if we just got sent a paycheck every month? I don't know how we're going to do it, but how amazing would it be? And I would just like let her think out loud. And you could just tell that you know she wants to be wealthy to a point where she doesn't have to work so she could travel more. So I see more people have this desire uh, to be free. And I think them actually physically showing up to work is bugging them a lot. Hey, Kyle, when you said said that you moved to Ukraine when you were making like a thousand bucks a month and had like mm-hmm. 20K in savings, 
how did you do that in the sense that how much does it cost to live in ukraine and would it be possible for people nowadays who want to start these online businesses which arman mentioned to actually move to these countries like india european sorry eastern europe and the cheaper you know sea countries is that viable because you've actually done it for me i was just born here well right now you can go to ukraine and the exchange rates like 30% worse than it was a couple of days ago so of course you can do it here of um, ukraine or russia oh russia is also in the tank with their uh their currency and their stocks holy crap i mean those their oil companies were down like 35% this morning so it's a bloodbath um the numbers gone higher right so i would say when i left I had that savings and basically I knew if I did absolutely nothing and made no money that I could probably float myself for like a year and a half and I was only ooh, 23 at that point so I was young. Um I think now you probably need to have a little bit more, probably you need 3k instead of 2k to get going, but it's certainly still possible. Um and of course the more frugal you are, you can obviously cut some corners, not eat out as much, not drink as much, rent shittier places, you can do all that. but i think yeah probably 2 and a half to 3k is a better number to get started per month so, right yeah per month correct but i think what a lot of people are missing now is like there's some good opportunities with companies to work remote if you're willing to like stay up late at night and you want to live in europe or maybe you want to live in latin america if you're qualified and skilled they are so desperate for labor now that you can kind of negotiate working from home and they'll probably not care if you're not actually in the country So that's an mm. option too. I wish more people would look at because you know, I have a client out here who was just in Ukraine and he was making, you know, like 200k, very very smart mathematician AI engineer. And then he had he he quit his job at a at a big company and then there was an, some smaller companies that were willing to pay him like 150, 125, and that's more than enough, you know. Out here like in Ukraine and other parts of Eastern Europe, you're making six figures, you're doing really well for yourself. So, yeah, it's certainly more than possible with what What's the about. tax rate in Ukraine? To 25, 20, 25? Yes, yeah, so same as India basically, not super high. Yeah. What about Russia? But I'm still I'm still at the mercy of the US though. That's the Why? thing. because i all my companies and everything is there just move them here no uh it's oh, it's way more complicated than that but basically and americans have it really bad man like if you live abroad you get your little foreign earned income exception but if i lived in all these different countries as long as i still have an american company that's the one that's bringing in the money i'm still taxed on everything in america and even california still claims me because all my family's there even if i moved to my state where my company is and i lived there for a year at the end of the day they would california would still say all your families in california you were only in wyoming for one year we're claiming you and you have to pay us it's wow a horrible system ah so it's like you know you're forced like they they they're forcing you regardless of where you are or whether you truly have allegiance to california or not correct and it's the us too it's the, we're the only only two countries in the world have like full you know worldwide tax no matter what and that's the us and north korea and emitria three countries actually <laughs> so that's the company we're with right and no one knows what emitria is either so <laughs> yeah, i was just about to say that what is that <laughs> never heard of it yeah go google it you won't even know where it is right <sighs> well i think most people like You actually brought up a good point Kyle where in corporate life nowadays there are tons of great opportunities for corporate life and earlier harsh you were asking a question like why do you think people have this mopey attitude at their work I think it's because a lot of them got that peak into working from home and when a company gives you that peak of working from home for a long period of time and now you're being asked to come back to the office there may be some attitude that's there So I I mean I just kind of reframe the question and I think that may be one of the reasons. I don't know if they necessarily want to start a business or an entrepreneurial creative project. I think it's because they're being forced to come into a company or they know someone that's working from home and they're like, "How come I can't work from home too?" But I think there's a lot of great opportunities for people in the corporate space nowadays. It's just that that ambition is lacking. So corporate people are like, "Yo, if you're an ambitious 
person, we'd easily take you up. Hmm. You know what I think is the reason? Like, I think it's the culture where everyone's so much entitled right right now. In the sense that everyone wants to think that they're like the hero of the story and not exactly you know someone who's just supposed to serve other people. Like, they want to feel like they're the celebrity, which is why you see all these nurses dancing on TikTok, etc. So they they can't stand the fact that their job involves having to serve other people, when truly deep down they just want to be the queen. Like all eyes on me, I'm the best, I'm the most entitled. When in reality, their job is to take care of other people. So I think there's a mismatch there, which what which is what we're seeing in their behavior. Mm-hmm. Do you guys know notice that at your places too? In like India, poor customer, no. poor customer service. Not in India. India is not that rich, so people need the money and they appreciate when you pay them. So it's not it's not the case, but it isn't what it used to be. But it is still very very good in India. Mm-hmm. And you, it's actually gotten better here. It used to be in like 2016 when I first got here. You could sit down at a restaurant, and you wouldn't get a menu for like 30 minutes. Get the check; it's another 30 minutes. I mean, it used to be you had to block out three hours to have dinner. Um, it's gotten better now, actually. So. I think, though, you know, kind of what we were talking about is people, I, I just wish corporations could figure this out, right? If you set, you know, and I understand in a big corporation, this is impossible, but if you set reasonable expectations about what needs to be accomplished, it doesn't matter how many hours a day they work to get it done. Like this stupid eight, nine hours sitting in this office under fluorescent lights is what's killing people. Like find a middle ground. People don't want to go back to the office full time. A lot of people like that camaraderie so say hey it's your choice you can do two days a week at home or three days like let people have a little flexibility and i feel like they perform a lot better and i think you know like i said i have this recruiting agency in ukraine we place ukrainian workers with american and british companies right and it's all remote they work from home they're almost always somewhat flexible hours and you know what everybody kind of wins and i just i don't understand why Normal offices and normal companies can't figure this out. That if your employees are happy, they're gonna be they're gonna perform better. Put and simple. Absolutely. I mean, how many when you were working nine to five? How many of those hours were you actually working? <laughs> Not very many. <laughs> I think I used to actually joke about this all the time. But I had my first job was at Hitachi, and it was very intense support where I was working on data systems. And it would be stuff like, hey, you know, Walmart calls you, and Walmart's servers are down in one area and you had to fix that really quick so that job was intense and i out of an eight hour shift i would actually work probably six to seven of them but my second job which was at a government think tank so just you know nonsense paper pushing i was supposed to work nine to six but i'd show up at 9 30 check some emails do a few things by 10 30 i was out on the terrace with my friend drinking coffee we'd stay there for 40 minutes i'd go for a two hour lunch i'd go to the gym or i'd go run on the beach and then I would just kind of horse around the rest of the afternoon, work a little bit more, go back to the balcony. And then my boss left at four. So usually by 4.45, I was like kind of planning my escape out of the office. Like, hey, who's Deuces. still here? <laughs> who, who, could I, who could I like crawl by? And I mean, but that place was miserable. Those, those short days where I didn't do anything were way longer than the days prior when I was busy. Wait, was I horrible. thought you said like you were hanging out at the beach. How is it miserable? Uh, because I had to go back to the office after. That's why. Ah. <laughs> yeah. But I would take, you know, just a long lunch, go for a run on the beach, and then have to go back. And I mean, I could have done most of that work in like an hour a day from all in my pajamas. And they just, you yeah, know, got to be in the office. So silly. How much do you guys work now? How many hours do you spend working, Kyle and Arman? Oh, uh, man. That's a. It's a hard question. It's, it's, it's a hard question because sometimes you're, it's difficult to draw the line. Like, is this, like, are we, are what we're doing right now considered work? I don't know. <laughs> had, That's what I'm I've saying. Had two, I've had two glasses of whiskey, so it's kind of hard to say that. <laughs> I, I, I would say. It's both play and work. Yeah, like, I would say for me, a lot of it is like, I would say like 10 hours. But that's where it becomes difficult to say. Like me going to the gym, I consider that a part of work because when I don't go to the gym, it's very hard for me to, let's say, give a speech or speak this long. You know, my mind becomes muddy. So now it's like, huh, is the gym work? 
what about recording this podcast with Kyle and Harsh? Um, it's difficult, man, but I'm probably just going to shoot out 10 hours like from maintaining, uh, working. And uh, yeah, yeah. What about you, Kyle? Uh, so basically I do three things. I trade, I do the personal brand, and I run the recruiting agency, right? And I would say on most days I start that work at 7.30 or 8 and I go to the gym at 11 and that's where I take care of everything like really important. After that in the afternoon becomes more like, oh, hey, you know, one of our, you know, we have like two employees here in Ukraine. They have, they have a question about setting up an interview or what a client specifically wants. And that's like you answer a few texts or emails here and there, maybe another just, you know, three minutes here, five minutes there. It's not much. So on average, I would say now it's like four to five, give or take. That sounds about right. Mm. And you, Harsh? It's it's kind of hard to say because, like you said, like it's difficult to determine what I'm doing is either work or not. But I would say that I'm productive for about 13, 14 hours per day. Now, that includes things like me studying computer science or me writing articles, me doing podcasts, me going to the gym. But so I would say like I'm productive for about 13-ish hours or 14 hours per day. Gotcha. So that, that's okay. A, yeah, I would I would then rethink mine too. If we're counting this, we're counting you know tweeting, blog articles, all that. Yeah, that's a better way to look at it. How much? How much are you productive in that? That's a better way to look at it. Yeah, I would say that's a better way to look at it because everything is connected in some way. Where for a while, like there was like one week when I was writing a book and I wasn't going to the gym, and I just noticed that to write, let's say, a certain amount of words, it was taking me double the amount of time, and that's when I was like, whoa. The gym is literally connected to the writing process. So that's when I started to view the gym as work. Not, okay, just go there if you want to go there. Or, you know, I, I had to go. So so f- we normally talk about this, uh, Kyle, where we're talking about a way for people to unwind. Um, would you say, like, for you, like, at the end of the day, you've had a productive day? Like, do you have a certain routine where you're like, all right, now I'm just going to unwind? Just watch junk food on TV or drink some wine, anything? I honestly just like to go out to dinner, you know, with my girl or something. I usually just go out to dinner, maybe have a drink or two, and then just kind of go home and maybe read a book. And so once in a while, I'll put on like an NBA game or some other sports. You know, I have a few hobbies I like to pursue. So yeah, that's usually the routine at the end of the night. What you sipping on right now? I am sipping on a 16-year-old Scotch whiskey. Nice. Yeah. Kyle, well, do you only dude, speak I English? evacuated all my important stuff. <laughs> I brought all the nice bottles of whiskey. I'm like, fuck it. This is the, if there's any night to pop it open, this is the night, right? Prepared for crisis. Yeah. Drink like it's the last day because it might any, be. What were you going to say, Harsh? <laughs> I kind of cut you off there a little bit. No, I, I was asking you, can you speak? Do you just speak English or do you also speak Ukrainian and Russian? Or what other I, languages speak, I speak some decent Russian. I'm capable of probably holding a 15 minute conversation. I understand quite a bit. My speaking kind of gets a little bit muddled. Um, my Ukrainian is not pretty much non-existent and they're not that similar. That's, you know, this is another thing we can talk about with this kind of cultural divide is that Ukrainian is actually much more similar to Czech and Polish than it is Russian. So um, I have a hard time with Ukrainian and I was just in the West where it is pure Ukrainian, and I couldn't understand anything. I was just speaking in English, totally lost. Hmm. Interesting. I had to ask, Carl, why yeah. Ukraine? Why didn't you pick any other country there? Because, you know, when people think of Europe, they think of, say, Britain and, you know, the yeah. Germany, Italy, and countries like that, France maybe, and not Ukraine, you know, Slovakia. I think what it really was, was it was kind of, I could kind of see the writing on the wall, right? Because when I went to Poland in 2014, it was going Western, but it was still Eastern. And Ukraine was a couple of years behind. And I think I was like, okay, this is getting more Western. It's got some potential. It's still got some good Eastern stuff, but it was all the good stuff of the West. And it was all the good stuff of the East at the time. Um, and I also saw a big potential just to grow, you know, with the country and make some good investments and buy some properties. And 
now that's probably all going to blow up in my face, you know, because I have a couple <laughs> properties here. But well, what am I going to do? Um, so that that was kind of why it was. It was it wasn't so far gone, and it was also a place, you know, when you start going all the way to like Russia, for example, you know, the as an American, the visas are a little bit harder. You know, they're a little bit more skeptical. And then, you know, of course, this is where I'm kind of split on it, right? Because I believe that. Russia's two major cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg are, are pretty well off, you know, pretty developed. But there's also a lot of areas if you don't want to live in those two that are that are really run down. It's a big place. So that's and of course those cities are liberal, right? They're they're totally liberal. Like I think I'm pretty sure St. Petersburg absolutely hates Putin. I think Moscow strongly dislikes him. It's those small village provinces where I wouldn't want to live that are fans of him, you know, the more nationalist kind of people. So that's kind of the story i i thought it had potential it was east and west and uh apparently i got it all wrong at this point as i'm <laughs> as i'm sitting here do you ever notice kyle that the more prosperous a nation is the more leftist it becomes and then it becomes like you know it becomes mm-hmm. a joke and collapses and then it gives uh, rise yep. to like more you know extremely right-wing people and then it becomes more prosperous and then it becomes more leftist again Well, what I mean, what do you think of this? But my theory is that people who don't have struggle are unhappy people, and then they create the struggle for themselves. Mm. Yeah, I think that humans evolved in, you know, an environment of scarcity. And when the scarcity is taken away, when you have so much prosperity that you don't have to worry about, say, being invaded or, or food or anything, then people tend to start, you know, behaving in crazy ways mm-hmm. which usually makes society as a whole collapse and then you have scarcity again because society mm-hmm. has collapsed but how does that apply like on a scale to the western world right now right like what is the scarcity and there is no scarcity so we make our own problems we say oh hey we need gender quotas in the military but I mean, that's my only theory. That That's all I have. I, I People need a problem. They need to struggle. That's it. I mean, the mind is built to solve problems. If it doesn't solve problems long enough, then it's going to create problems. It's a built-in feature in the mm-hmm. mind. Well, that makes sense. And it used to be that, you know, we didn't, there was always a problem to solve, right? Because people only lived to be 30 or 40 years old. And that's like with the COVID stuff, that's what's driven me nuts. It's like, okay, someone who is 80 years old, their death is not a, even 70, it's not a tragedy. I hate to say it, but it's their death is not a tragedy at that point. That's double what we used to live, you know, 100 years ago-ish. So that's, you're right. They have to, the human mind has to solve problems, no matter what. Yeah, I think COVID was just, like, the government response to it has just been very irrational. Like, it doesn't make mm-hmm. any sense whatsoever what they were doing and what they are doing. Unless it's all planned, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's all planned, you know, because across the world, it's only like hurt the people in power in a way. Because, yeah, it's true that in the West, they've gained more power. But in Eastern countries, it's made people poorer and really mad at the government. Like, what the hell are you guys doing? Like, we're tired of this and things are getting way more expensive here in India, at least. Like, you could get... If you were, say, buying kerosene, it would cost you, I think, 1,100 or 1,200 rupees. And now it's like 2,100 rupees for the same amount of kerosene. So people are really, really mad right now. So That's I the don't... thing. They're, they've managed to stave that off in the West just by giving them money. Yeah, but that's because the West, like at least the US, it's their currency. You know, they can print more of it. Yeah, but exactly. It's going to catch up. It's going to catch up eventually. Uh, today might even be the day, man. This is their perfect reason to exit and crash the markets. So yeah, we're going to see. The next few weeks are going to be very interesting. Well, there's actually a very interesting question from one of the writers from Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. So how is the fiat versus Bitcoin situation in Ukraine if everyone tries to get cash from banks? I definitely have already heard that some ATMs are totally out of cash and you know, a few weeks ago, the exchange rate was $1, you'd get 26, 27 grivnas, and I saw up to 33 today. 
So that's obviously already just taken a total dump. And they're used to that here, though. Like no one here keeps their money in the banks. No one puts their savings in the local currency because when all this stuff started happening in 2014, it went from, I think, oh, like four to six grievances for a buck to 40. So Damn, their currency what? lost 90% of its power overnight, basically. Um, yeah, really, really bad. So that being said, they have adopted Bitcoin. Um, they even have, they've started to regulate it, but there are Bitcoin banks that have been in use for several years and you can just walk in. They say, do you want to buy or sell? And you say, I want to sell. They say, send it to this address. And then 10 minutes later, they hand you the cash. That's it. Hmm. Okay. So Bitcoin is pretty open there. What about other stuff like Ethereum, Monero? I wouldn't all of say that? it's open though, bro. It's maybe some of the young guys, you know, because there's a lot of really smart Ukrainian devs, right? And a lot of smart technical people, but it's not like anyone over the age of like 40 is probably any aware of it at all. Oh, so they don't have the education on it even? No, they definitely don't. And you know what? Like, it's not going to happen. Like the people who grew up under the Soviet Union grew up under communism as much as they should be educated about it because they've seen it before. They are just trying to survive and that's not going to change. So that's, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say they're educated and they're knowledgeable about it, about it, but the young generation is, and they have infrastructure for it. Get them on Harsha's Bitcoin course. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will start passing it out. We haven't translated to Ukrainian and Russian. <laughs> Uh, it's at but teach no. yourself crypto.com. Teach yourself yes. crypto.com. I think though too, um, you know, to answer your question, there is Ethereum, Monero. Basically, at some of these banks, they say any currency on Binance, we will sell you cash for, or we will buy it. So yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of adoption here. We'll see how it goes. You know, I think this country is going to have some obviously very interesting times ahead of it. What's the average income in Ukraine? How much do people make? That's a kind of a tricky question. So I'd say in the in the capital, it's probably a little bit higher. I'd I'd say countrywide, it's probably about three hundred dollars. In the capital, maybe more like six to seven hundred a month, give or take a month dollars. That's U.S. dollars. Um, you know, like someone, and it, it varies too. Someone who speaks good English will obviously make a, a higher salary, but I would say your average, like entry level worker at, say, a customer service job who speaks good English and is expected to interact in English, probably entry level here in Kiev is probably about three fifty four hundred. Give hey, that's not so bad for like an entry level worker. What are the costs like? How much does a meal cost? What is rent like? So. If you like, say, want to rent out a nice new one bedroom apartment, not in the center, it'll probably be about six hundred, seven hundred dollars a month, give or take. But that would be near a metro. If you go like further away from a metro, you could probably get that down to three hundred, maybe two hundred dollars. But yeah, it's very common for people to live with their parents or live with friends. Um, you know, it also depends on the quality you're getting. Like, you know, you can get some really run down, horrible apartments at a good price, but your your toilet may leak, your sink will leak, you know, everything will just be falling apart. I live in the center and I'm currently renting a place and I pay thirteen hundred dollars. It's one hundred and twenty five square meters and it's very central, but it's old. Um, you know, it's not so old that it's unlivable, but it's it's not certainly not new. And. Yeah, so that's that's approximate cost. A meal out, decent meal out, probably an entree is eight to ten bucks, maybe twelve. Kind of depends on where you go. Um, drinks, you know, you can get a beer in a pub for two dollars, or you can go all the way up to, you know, paying eight dollars for a beer in some of the really nice restaurants. There's a there's a very wide gap. You know, there's a very high end restaurants that could easily make the Michelin stars, and then there's just some absolute dumps of local like pubs that you can get anything you want and it's almost free and they have like the franchises too mcdonald's burger king that kind of stuff just mcdonald's no bk um no taco bell mcdonald's and kfc are the only ones if you want to talk like price of big macs i think a big mac meal oh probably about five bucks four maybe give or take okay and is that place like can you get around without a car 
Yeah, no, I don't even own a car because I live in the center. Um, I would never want a car. It's too much of a pain. I wish I, I wish I had one right now, obviously. But yeah, you don't need a car if you live. Just steal a car, Carl. Just steal a no, car. I have, I have plenty of access to them if I need it. But yeah, they have Lyft, Uber, all of that. Yeah, to cross the river and go about eight kilometers is like five bucks on average, give or take. So it's it's still very affordable by Western standards. You know, everything's gone up in price over the last few years. But I think the biggest indicator for me is there is a very nice restaurant right in the center of Kiev. It's called Beef, Meat, and Wine. And it is, it's phenomenal, actually. And they used to have a business lunch where you could have three courses. And it was 120 grivnas five years ago. It was like three bucks. And now it's 450, 500 grivnas. It's almost 20 bucks for that. So that's always like my my index is what is the business price or the business lunch price at this restaurant and it's it's gotten more expensive for sure everywhere in the world has right I believe it was around 2015 or 2016 Kyle where a lot of people were moving to Europe to practice pickup artistry do you remember that era it's I wouldn't say it really stopped. But yeah, no, I do. <laughs> Are they still doing that? Are a lot of Americans going to Europe to try to pick up women? They definitely are, man. There's still a lot of um, boot camps and a lot of people like walking around picking up girls. I mean, you know, like mystery method, right? I do. I, I remember the show. Uh-huh. Yeah, dude. He, he was in Kiev last year. I met him. Oh, you met so- him? Yeah, I met him on the street. Um, a couple of my buddies are actually like, they went out with him a few times. So it is definitely alive and well still. Wait, is this real? People will move like all the way to Ukraine just to pick up women? That sounds it's more like, like unreal. Uh, well, there's a few elements of that. There's definitely people that will go and pay for a week of coaching in a place like Ukraine. And then there's definitely people who say, hey, the options are so shitty in the West, I'm going to move abroad. And this was something that was really common in 2015, 2016. I saw a lot of these YouTube channels blowing up where they were just talking about their entire journey. What's it (laughs) called, Kyle? Isn't it called like RSD or? Yeah, RSD is like the big one that was, oh, but they started like, I think in like 2005 long time okay. ago they were in the original uh the game by neil strauss i think that company started around then and yeah there's all they've been around for a while but they they still are right rsd real social dynamics what's mm-hmm. the pickup artistry culture in india like harsh do you guys have one no not that i'm aware of you know i'm now the type of guy who goes out to too many parties like i'm mostly like a business person but i don't think there is it's a more conservative country At least most of India is, you know, certain parts of the cities, yeah, maybe there might be. But India overall is very conservative. Like we do have Tinder and everything nowadays, but I don't know. I don't know. To be very honest with you, Arman, I'm more of a business. Got it. So for in the US, I would say it was really popular in New York for a while. Like a lot of people were just going to New York, moving to the cities to, you know, walk the streets, practice pickup. And that's when I started to hear about Europe. And, you know, it's not like they're just goofing around. I mean, they're over here making field reports. They're breaking it down, like what went right, what went wrong. They're working with a coach. So it's it's a they lifestyle have a change. Coach. They have a coach? Yeah. Kyle, did you ever, did, weren't you ever involved in something like that? I used to coach, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for pickup artistry right yeah i used to coach game like night game in san diego and la yeah guys would pay for me to go out with them and teach them how to talk to girls that's kind of how i got started literally mm-hmm. people like you know you know have you heard this term like don't put pussy on a pedestal yeah <laughs> and i think that's why so many of them end up so fucked up and it's because they put their whole worth and life on how women feel about them and that's a recipe for disaster yeah that sounds crazy like i would never move to a particular place just for like the women like i would move for like better business or something or like better taxes but women is like women are secondary you know the way i think where your life comes first like you have to live a great life and 
women will usually just find you. At least that's how it's been for me. Where women don't have great options, you know, most guys are losers. So if you live a great life, you make a lot of money, then, you know, you're the great catch. You don't have to, like, go and try to get lots of women. Lots of women will just come to you because you're the best option. Like, you're the prize, mm-hmm. not the contestant. So it blows my mind, to be honest, that people would, like, go all the way to a different country and then hire a coach to talk to women. Because usually to talk to women, you just have to talk to them, like, say, hello, how are you? Out of curiosity, Kyle, I mean, was that their main intention of going there? Or were they pretty much going there for business reasons and they also wanted to learn pickup along the way? You know, I think a lot of guys, you know, like for my situation, for example, I moved abroad because I wanted to build a business and I was not happy with the way the women were going in the West. So it was like a combination of everything. And I think that's pretty typical is you'll have a guy in London and he looks at, you know, the the whales waddling around the streets of London with their pints of Guinness mate. And he'll say, (laughs) he'll take one trip to the East and then say, fuck this. And that's it. And so then it becomes like, how do I make enough money to get out there full time? Or at least, you know, I can work in London and take trips occasionally. And that's usually how it goes, I think. Okay. So pretty much it's the women that's the first priority. And then they're kind of building their life around that. I think so. I I think because it's so bad in some places that they see it and that's the catalyst. Do you have any stories or insights about, you know, your time as a pickup coach? I mean, is there certain mistakes you see guys making a lot, uh, certain approaching uh, errors, anything like that? I think the biggest issue is that men are just no longer men. They don't have any concept of being strong, being decisive, you know, anyone who's looking for coaching is like always, you know, coming to you in a way and saying, Hey, what do I do here? What do I do? And that's what it comes down to. The the common mistake is just not being enough of a normal man who goes after what he wants in life and is decisive and is strong and is able to just make decisions. You know, and you see this all the time as men say, oh, hey, where do you want to go for dinner? Like, let's have a first date. Where do you want to go? Oh, I don't know. You pick. Oh, well, no, it's okay. You pick. And that's that's where it all falls apart. Sometimes you I know, wonder how much. Go ahead, Harsh. Sorry. This reminds me of this. You know, I had like a couple of friends earlier. So when I started dating, they would ask me like, you know, what do I wear on a date? Where do I go? What do I say? And I remember telling them that. If you're asking these questions, these types of questions, you can't go on a date because why would anyone want to go out on a date with someone who doesn't know what to wear, where to go and what to say? So it really comes down to like living like a great life as a man. And then you just have to be yourself. That's hard for a lot of guys to do in today's world. That's the problem. We're fixing that, that aren't we, Kyle? Yeah, we are. Sometimes one I wonder how much one, one was on at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Make women great again. <laughs> one. Yep. How much of it is, would you say, skill versus volume? Because I remember there was this one guy I used to know who had no game, and he was, I would say, five foot two. Uh, he looked like an Indian Harry Potter. Hey, and come on! He, what's wrong with the, why is it bad? That's to racist. Be? No, I mean racist. like he, no. He, he literally had like this big circular glasses. He was from India. Hey, very, Arman, you're short. Indian too, okay? No, and the thing with him was, he would pretty much hit on anyone, anyone that uh, was a woman. He would just hit on them. And Sounds he, like an Indian. <laughs> his volume was so high that he would eventually close. And he showed us a lot of the pictures of the girls that he was hooking up with, and we're like. Wow. But he had no skill at all. He would just go up to them. Uh, tons of women would reject him. But from those tons, like a few of them would say, sure, why not? So how much of it is volume versus skill? Uh, so that's the thing, right? Is guys focus too much on getting that skill instead of building themselves up. So... When you're first starting out, obviously, you know, here's the thing. If you're like a cool guy and you're in good shape and you have income and you have cool hobbies, you have interesting things to talk about, then all of a sudden you don't need all that volume. But if you're 
a loser who can't talk to girls and you're out of shape and you don't have anything interesting going on for you, then yeah, you're going to need to like spam approaches. I think that's, that's what guys get so wrong is they focus on the game instead of themselves. It's a lot solution. about, isn't like, well, you know what this conversation reminds me a lot of, it's like conversion rates on sales pages. Like your conversion rate versus how much traffic you're getting. So if you have a shitty ass sales page, if you can still blow traffic to it, someone's going to buy. But you would still rather have a high conversion rate. Mm-hmm. I see the analogy. It's also, uh, it's also in terms of marketing too. Let's say you've never met a guy before and he's over here trying to sell you on a service. Yeah, I mean, maybe down the line, you'll be okay to open to it later on. But let's say you're constantly watching someone's YouTube videos, you know this person, and you could tell that this is a high value sort of guy. But then you could, you're much more likely to work with this person. So I recall in 2016 to 2017, there was another thing called like social circle game, where rather than you just cold approaching random people, you focused more on building your social circle and getting warm leads from them. There were a lot of trends in the pickup artistry niche. What's the trend now? Do you, are you guys aware? I have no idea, to be honest. Yeah, me either. <laughs> I mean, I would assume that nowadays... Oh, Instagram. Instagram. Instagram, yeah. Yeah. It's got to be Instagram, right? What else would it be? You have I don't any tips know. on that, Kyle? No, none at all. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's retired out of the game. I'm retired, yep. <laughs> I mean, do you it, have a personal Instagram? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, me neither. What about you, Arman? Yeah, that's the one you ended up following me on recently. Armani oh, Talks underscore. That was a personal one, okay. So you guys both have Instagrams? I only have one for life math money. I don't have a single social media account for my you know, real identity. Mm-hmm. Like you could search my full name and not find anything, like not a single thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing though. That's what people use these days. You know, it's, that's how they talk. There's no texting anymore. WhatsApp. It's, it's Instagram DMs. That's, that's what works now. So you said you have a personal account or you don't Kyle? I don't know. Okay, so you two are probably the two only people I know who don't have a personal Instagram account. Do you have a personal anything, Kyle? A Facebook? TikTok? Um, no, to TikTok. I have a Facebook, which is mostly just for uh, clients. I mean, I, I don't know the last time I even posted anything to it. No, I'm not into it. Other than Twitter, I'm just not into that social media. It's just not that interesting to me anymore. I recall we were talking, me and you, Harsh, we were talking about that recently. And I was like, you're so strange, Harsh, because you're the only person I know who doesn't have a personal account. And then we were laughing because Harsh technically has the biggest social media following. So just intuitively, you would also expect him to have a bunch of these personal accounts, but he doesn't have that. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty surprising to me as well because i deleted my facebook account back in 2015 feb 2015 my personal one and then for like the next three four years i had zero personal social media and then i start life math money and then i have to make social media accounts and as someone who has zero experience with social media i hadn't even used it in like four years suddenly i'm suddenly i'm doing so well so it was very surprising to me I mean, it's a good habit to try to avoid. Um, so, Kyle, we're getting more questions coming in. Uh, you done to answer a couple of more questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Okay, so ones? one of the... Oh, wait. The so, first one. Can I ask the first one? Yeah, go ahead. Kyle, if you were given a choice, would you rather be Russian or Ukrainian? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are the Russian troops invading listening to this? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Or the Ukrainian police listening. That that would depend on what the answer I'd give. Um, ultimately, I'd like this place to be its own sovereign country, but I also recognize in the political landscape that that's probably not possible. I don't know 
if the whole country is about to not be the whole country, that seems a little extreme. Um, oh, I don't want to answer that one, bro. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to uh, I'm, I'm just going to say no thank you. Uh, oh, wait. I think I, I hear a siren. There's an air siren going on. I have to go. Sorry. Got to go to the oh, basement. <laughs> I'm, I'm disconnecting. <laughs> hey, Kyle, but by saying neither, you might piss off both sides, don't you think? So the Russians might be like, what do you mean neither? Like, what about, like, why not us? And the Ukrainians I, might say the same thing. Let, let me put it this way. I'm anti-West. I'm anti-America. I, I do not believe Western governments have anything good planned for its citizens or the world. So if that mechanism means, you know, a little more Russian influence, I'm totally good with it. But I also obviously want the people in my life here in this country to be to be happy. And they're not going to be happy with how this goes. So, but you know what? They're probably just going to have to deal with it. That's the reality. Makes sense, man. Yeah, <laughs> See, we're asking the that's hard. My, that's my diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> I could try to incriminate him, Harsh. Yeah. No, just say, okay. <laughs> that's a good question, though. It's a hard one. And I'm totally dodging it. I'm totally dodging it. I'll admit it, but it's a good question. Okay. So, these are three questions from one person. What does he want us to know? What are we missing? What aren't they telling us? Who? Who's he? What do they? You're the he. Like, what does oh. Kyle want us to know? What are we missing? Why? Aren't, what aren't they telling us? About the situation? Mm-hmm. Um, what they're not telling is the other side of it. The Western media is not telling the other side of why this might happen. It's it's just pure like dictator, right? Instead of, well, why would he want to do this? Um, so that's the part you're not getting. And I think you're also not getting the part about that. I think the politicians here are very much controlled now by the Western media. Um, you know, there's all, if you look it up, there's a lot of ties and a lot of money being sent here. That's the part they're never going to tell you is how much money has gone into this country from the West. How many, you know, how much of our tax dollars has, and then why do they want this war? What benefit is it to them? And, you know, why, why should we support it? Even? No one's on the other side of the world. So that's the answer to the first part of the question. What was the second part again? Uh, what are we missing? I think I just said that, right? Yes. And the third yeah, one okay. is, what aren't they telling us? And that's pretty much what you were talking about. Same with thing, the media, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So this is another question. And this is one... Um, which, okay, let me just see. Okay, so how's the free speech like over where your region? I mean, is it is it normal for someone to just say the leader is a dummy, or is that something that is not normal? See, this is where I kind of have a differing opinion too, right? Like, yeah, you can absolutely criticize the government here. That's not going to be a problem. But I think people look at China and they look at Russia and they say, well, you can't criticize the government there. But I don't think the West is any better. Like, you know, if you and I are sitting in a bar in Moscow or Beijing and we say we don't like Putin, we don't like Z, are they really going to come and arrest us on the spot for that? No. But they do absolutely imprison and take control over their direct competitors or their harshest critics. But is that any different than the West? How about Seth Rich? How about Jeffrey Epstein, who was suicided off? How about Ed Snowden? How about Julian Assange? Are we really any better? That's what I, that's the missing link is I don't think we are any better than the Eastern countries. Like, I, I do not believe if I go into Moscow and, and talk some bad things about Vladimir Putin in a bar that the FSB um, is going to show up on the spot and arrest me. I don't, I don't see that happening at all. But what if you have a pretty popular blog? <laughs> What then? Well, but that, but then that's the same thing, right? The West, Julian Assange, he had a pretty popular website, and they, what did they do to him? Edward Edward Snowden exposed some pretty big secrets, and now he's living in exile. Is are they any better? I I don't think so. Hardly. The they just maybe covered of, up a little better. It's the degree of how much you can do, in the sense that maybe you can't say like you can't oppose the government to the extremes. But you can say, you know, that it's it's on it's on a switch. I would say it's like a, it's like a range of how far. 
uh, how far you can go from the what the government wants. For example, if you if you for example criticize Z too much, like even a bit, you might get silenced in China, but that won't happen in the US. I think they do it more covertly. It's or covertly, right? Like you no one is allowed to get too big who's not controlled the opposition. And I think you see this with the COVID narrative too, is you had a lot of people who everyone thought was very right wing, very pro Trump, who, you know, then all of a sudden said, Oh, put on your mask and get your vaccine, like Scott Adams, like Taleb, all these guys who I think they just shadow ban you more into, you know, perpetuity or just, you know, to the shadow realm, so to speak. They don't give you the audience anymore. But I mean, I get it. it it's a step maybe worse in the East, but I think it's laughable that people think that the Western politicians are just angels. True. I see what you mean. I think that a lot of these Western countries are a bit jealous of how much control, you know, Eastern governments have over the people and mm-hmm. they are trying to like, get to the same level of authority authoritarianism. Like if you take Canada, they're essentially trying to be China. Like that's what the guy said. Like he really admires China and is trying to be more like mm-hmm. them. But I think that's, it's so odd to me because I think, they definitely are more free out here, at least like in these countries. Like I've lived in Poland, I've lived in Czech Republic, Hungary, here. They're way more free out here than the US. They don't have these crazy tax laws, these crazy overreaching systems. You know, the politics are not quite as divided. They're far more free out here. And I don't know what it's like in, you know, China exactly, obviously, but I don't, I, from everyone I talk to in Russia, it's not like they're. I don't. I think they have more freedoms than we would in California or even Florida, probably. Oh, China is much worse from what yeah, I. China's heard. worse. For you sure. know, in China, if you're like an activist, what they did with the COVID crisis was that they gave everyone like they made them install an app which tracks them, and like if they are at risk of COVID, the thing is supposed to turn red, and then you can't go out. Mm-hmm. So every time these activists, which China doesn't like, go near the airport. And the app says red. that, yeah, it turns red and then they can't fly. So essentially, these activists are like nullified where they can't really mm-hmm. go anywhere because their app will just turn red. Is, that, like any different than, a leash. is that any different than in Canada where they park their trucks outside and they said anyone who has donated your bank account's frozen? Is that much yeah, better? Yeah, Canada is a lot mm-hmm. like China right yeah, now. Yeah, Canada. Like the way they're yeah. acting. I don't know yeah, what to think, think of it because the guy is like lecturing everyone else on like, you know, how to protest and how he, how much he cares about the protests in India just like a year ago. And he's doing all of this, which makes no sense. Well, you should have seen what he said about Ukraine yesterday is we support Ukraine being a free and, you know, sovereign democracy as he's freezing people's bank accounts. I mean, just a hypocrite. Yeah. I think it's the same, you know, like, for example, if you take the border of Ukraine, like the U.S. cares so much about Ukraine's border, but not their own border. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just politics, you know. It's just politics. Yeah. But it's the most amazing, though, is that more people can't figure that out. Right. And they have no idea. NPCs. Uh, I know. know. NPCs. (laughs) Another question, Kyle, is yep. do you see guerrilla warfare from Ukraine's side towards the Russians if Ukraine loses? Probably not where I am. I think in the western part of the country where they're very pro-Ukrainian, very anti-Russian, I could see it. Um, you know, it's like, here's where it's it's so tough, right? You know, defend your country, defend your culture. But at the same time, you know, the Ukrainian Navy has like three ships and they're all sunk now. So what? are you really? Yeah, it, it was done before I woke up this morning. You know, it actually sunk them. Oh, uh, they put they're on fire. I don't know if they're probably sunk by now. But yeah, nine o'clock this morning, all three ships were out of service at that point from what I saw. So, yeah, I don't did, know. Did you hear anything about drafts or is that not even a thing? Um, yeah, so I can confirm actually that my friend's wife's stepdad, who was retired, was called up um, out of retirement 
and that they did call up the reserves. And I, I know a few, you know, young Ukrainian men, obviously, and they were concerned, obviously, that they would, could be drafted. And they can technically here, I believe, draft anyone from 18 to 55 if it came to it. But actually getting them, you know, at this point, it's so chaotic and they're so unprepared. It's, it's a whole other manner to actually get them to all show up, right? I mean, the freaking president was tweeting out, if you have a passport, come to a square and get a gun and stand with us, right? I mean. He wrote that? Yeah, it's on Twitter. It's what? on his fucking Twitter account, bro. That's insane. I mean, this, and this is a president. You know, go to my profile on Twitter right now, Kyle Trouble. Scroll down to the media. This is a president. He used to be a comedian. He used to literally play the piano with his penis. <laughs> go look at it, bro. <laughs> or go, YouTube Vladimir Zelensky piano penis. He is literally the... has clips of hey, him. I think you, you want to put it in the chat time. here? Uh, t- oh, I see it now. There's a guy standing. His hands are up. His pants are down. What the yep. hell? That's the president of Ukraine. Left or right? Left. Ah, oh, dang. Oh, you were telling me once that this guy was in like a show about anti-corruption and that's how he got elected? Correct. He had a show he was famous for called The People's President or something. He's not um, He's not an idiot. He founded like a, a comedy channel. He's a multimillionaire prior to all this. So he's not, you know, a total moron he has some business sense but yeah he's he was a clown before that's the problem you know trump at least had some business sense but yeah well here you know i'm gonna put this in our chat here on on zencaster click that link and have a laugh wait opening it it's only 40 seconds (laughs) cut the what the fuck? <laughs> wow. I'll link it in the description box if you guys are curious what Kyle just sent over. Yeah, I think you could play it in like the podcast itself. Like just have a 40 second pause of this guy <laughs> playing a piano. A <laughs> I don't know if I want to put the viewers through this pain. It's not that bad. It's, it's amusing. I'll put it that way. It is really funny. So another question, Kyle, mm-hmm. is I want to know what the people of Ukraine really want. Ukraine is just a 30-year-old nation. I think most ethnic Russians won't have a problem joining Russian Federation. The media usually lies about stuff like this. Maybe he can tell his people's opinion. Wait, Ukraine is just 30 years old? Correct. Huh, it was in the Soviet good. Union. It split. Everything kind of fell apart, and they were kind of you know, pushed apart at that point. But yeah, their 30 year anniversary was just last year. They had a big celebration about it. I heard they had nukes earlier. They did. Yeah. Well, when they were in the Soviet Union, they had a lot of the nukes, a lot of the aerospace. They were a real huge part of, you know, the broader picture of the Soviet Union. But that has kind of obviously changed. And they've signed, they signed away all those nukes in 1994, I believe it was. So, um, but to answer your question there, um, Armand, I think most Ukrainians probably, I'll say like 70%, probably want nothing to do with Russia at this point because they feel like they've been invaded and violated. That said, when it comes to stuff like this, people usually join the winners. You know, like what's that phrase? Women wait at the finish line and fuck the winners. Like when it comes down to it, people usually cave in. So we'll see. Mm. You know, it's such a mistake to, denu- to, to denuclearize yourself, you know, because if they had nuclear weapons, they would not have been invaded now today. It would not have come to this. It's such a complex history, though, because they were so intertwined, you know, from World War II to 1991 when the Soviet Union fell and then they signed the nukes away. They became, you know, their own sovereign state and up, you know, like I said, this whole thing started off because of a pro-Russian president signing a gas deal with Russia. So up until 2014, they were still very much kind of tied at the hip and they were still very much allies. And that's really just kind of fallen apart in the last eight years. 
do you have access to world star hip hop Kyle? no what is that okay so it's a website that shows a lot of different viral videos and they're updating a lot of videos about what's going on in ukraine and one of the videos i'm watching right now is it's titled russian air fighter jet fires missiles at innocent civilians hiding in fear inside their home so do you want to link it in the chat let me take a look okay yeah man i mean everything's going i mean do you hear any noise or anything no, I haven't heard anything since the sirens this morning. And I okay. thought I heard a few helicopters this afternoon. But from everything I've seen, they have purely focused on military weapons depots, military airstrips. Um, obviously, there's been casualties, but I have not seen anything too crazy at this point. But on no, it's totally Twitter, normal, dude. It's quiet out there. On Twitter trends, it says Russia has seized control of airports near Kiev. Ukrainian interior minister says. I do believe that is true. There is a military airport to the west of the capital called the Antonov Airport. And I believe they have a military depot and, you know, a runway there. So they have seized control of that. From everything I've heard, they've also seized the major civilian airport since this morning. I haven't actually seen any proof of that yet but you know there's obviously no flights going on and that's the one place that can actually land big planes i believe um other than this other one that they've taken over now uh, all right let me watch this video yeah i mean there's a few videos coming out on world star hip-hop do you have access to that harsh I do. Let me see. I'm watching this one. Horrible Russian air fighter jets fires missiles at innocent civilians hiding in fear inside their home. Okay. Ah, uh, does a baby really cry like that after a freaking missile hits? I don't know. That that doesn't look real. The videos. Yeah, why are they all still alive after? I see the missile fire off, and then they're all still running around. I don't hear it's... the missile. like So you want to assume it's going to, going to make a noise. So, yeah. I didn't hear an explosion. I heard a, like a whiz. I didn't hear a boom. You never know. You know, like it might be real. It might not be. Now, nowadays, know. it's yeah. very difficult to believe what you see on the internet, especially from these news websites. Yeah, I mean... Just the headline, horrible Russian air fighter fires missiles at innocent civilians hiding in fear inside their home. Like, uh, I don't know. Everything about, should be skeptical. What about other people that you know around the Ukraine area? Are, are they reporting anything back? Um, my friend Ryan and my business partner kind of lives, he's on the other side of the city from where I am now, but it was very log jammed earlier uh, this morning and he has posted videos now and it's like there's no one there it's totally empty no one on the streets really no cars no traffic and he heard i think the sirens once this afternoon and that was it gotcha is Dude, that the rhyme from what... twitter sorry go ahead i i was lost a bit uh, is that the rhyme from twitter oh uh, yeah ryan booth correct yeah okay Check this. Ukraine on Twitter, they, they seem to think it's a Twitter fight. Like, what, what are they saying? Hey, people, let's demand Twitter to remove Adorate Russia from Twitter. So it shouldn't be on Twitter. Like, that's their demand. Remove Russia's account from Twitter. So this is like, uh, you know, I love and this country and these people, but this is not how you win this battle, right? Like... <laughs> They seem to be living in the world where, you know, like you have like a debate and the one who wins the debate wins the thing. This is like an actual physical war. And like it, three hours ago, they tweeted, tag Adorate Russia, Adorate Russia and tell tell them what you think about them. Like, why? Oh, yeah. Like, wow. What's that going to do? <laughs> it's this like, is like you what know, I mean, right? They're like, well, this is our safe space. <laughs> Yeah, our feelings are most important. <laughs> Another question is, what do you think is Putin's endgame? 
Uh, I'm torn on this. I would have said, I, I thought his goal was definitely when he recognized those uh, republics, it would have been to then, you know, get them set up and make that a buffer to NATO. And now it definitely appears that they are basically those those cities were controlled by the separatists already in a few areas around it. But that entire region that falls under those cities territory was still mostly under Ukrainian control, probably at least 70 percent. So definitely his goal is those plus um, a few other areas of vital interest. What I don't know is whether that means the whole country. At this point, it seems like the whole country is needs to be, as he said it himself, demilitarized. So if that was a necessary step to secure those regions, maybe that's what he decided to take. But yeah, I believe his goal at this point is to, at a minimum, have those areas under control and make sure Ukraine has absolutely no military capability. And what's uh, Putin's perception like in that region? I mean, do they... Uh, I mean, is he feared? Or is he someone that's seen kind of like a clown? Hated. I mean, he's, he's hated. hated, not a clown. Hated. He's con- he's considered a a lunatic, a tyrant. Hated, but not. Uh, I've never heard the words idiot though. Hmm. You know, from from someone who's not like super aware about the situation, like locally, as someone from India. From my perception, it looks like Putin is one of, you know, a very good leader in the sense that when you compare him to Western leaders, he seems like a more, like more like a real leader, you know, like Western leaders mm-hmm. seem to be all about optics and what speech you give, what you say. But Putin seems to be someone who really cares about his country and will do what's best for it, regardless of people's feelings. So that's my not so informed assessment of it. I don't disagree, right? I mean, it's like, hey, I wish our politicians in the States looked after our borders like that. (sighs) You know, people are going to do shrewd things to, you know, in their own interests or in their country's interests. And as horrible as it is to have this happening to people here, it's it's just the reality of the world. It's not fair. (laughs) The world's not fair. Uh, More people should learn that lesson, but they still don't. Man, I'm looking at this picture you posted on Twitter, Kyle. It's like Defense Minister of Russia. And it's this really, really stern looking guy in like military uniform. Yeah. And then you have the defense ministers of Western Europe and it's just women. Like not even like in military uniform, like regular school teacher type women. Mm-hmm. I think they've just gotten way too comfortable. They've forgotten that war can happen. It's like reality. You know how, like, you know, you have a kid and the kid hasn't, like, it's it's too small, so it hasn't experienced the real world. So he thinks that life is all rainbows and sunshines. And for him, the harsh rea- reality of the outside world just doesn't exist. I think that's how a lot of these Western European countries are. Like, they've just been protected by the U.S. They don't have, like, an army. And they've forgotten that war exists. Which is so ironic because they didn't have one that long ago, World War II, right? I mean, it hasn't been a a conflict on that level since then, and they all just forgot. But you know what? When I flew through the Frankfurt airport last year to sit at McDonald's, they said, show me your papers. So it's pretty clear that they forgot everything. What is Frankfurt? Uh, German airport. Sorry. Oh, okay. Just specified. Okay. Yeah, it's a German city. <laughs> so yeah, the the Germans asking for your papers and <laughs> no no sense of understanding that at all. You know what they say, right? History repeats itself. <laughs> it it does, man. It's amazing. You know what is Germany like, though? Is it really as bad as they say? Because. I have a friend who lives in Germany and he says it's like one of the most prosperous countries in Europe, in Europe. I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's mostly because they just have so much control over the EU. They're definitely like the head honcho, kind of like, you know, DC controls the US, like Germany controls the EU, which is uh, 27 countries, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, no, it is prosperous. I mean, it's nice, but it's very... I've only been once. I've only been to Berlin. And I found it very stale. Um, the food, the people, just everything was just kind of bland. I wasn't a fan of it at all. 
So that's my two cents. And I have personally no desire to spend more time there. Hmm. How do these countries think of themselves? Do they still think of themselves as like great powers? Like, you know, like Britain used to have an empire. Portugal used to have an empire. So do these countries still think of themselves as powerful, like France used to have an empire? Or do they think, think of themselves as like not as relevant today? I think Britain does. And a lot of banking still runs through London. So maybe they have a little bit of a right to it. I don't think Portugal feels that way but definitely the french are always arrogant and i'm I'm always thinking like you guys haven't really done anything in the last couple hundred years (laughs) to be honest like i don't really know what you're bragging about at this point other than your maybe your wine and your cheese but yeah i'd say the french still kind of have a bit of that attitude i see would you say there's still a lot of culture in the european area yeah that's what is confusing not confusing but everyone you know you could have a country this little small country that's maybe you know a couple hundred kilometers long that thinks it's so so different from the country right next door right and it's like oh and the reality is you guys are a little more similar than you realize right you know there's there's some differences but they're not so profound that's what i enjoy about traveling when i travel I don't want to be reminded of where I just came from. I want to feel like I'm entering this brand new world. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been to the Bahamas, Kyle? Uh, just for one day, like on a cruise. Yeah, it was really fast. Yeah, for a cruise. Like when I go there, I want to have food that is local to your guys' area. I don't want to see another McDonald's and Dunkin' mm-hmm. Donuts and eat there. So that seems as though it's something that's melting away. The more that globalized media is taking over, where nowadays I hear from different people living in different parts of the world, uh, their culture is very similar to all other cultures. So that's why I was curious. I mean, when you go to Europe, does it feel like you're entering this brand new world or is it pretty similar to California, for example? Oh, it totally feels like a brand new world, but you can't, it doesn't feel like a brand new world, say going from Poland to Czech Republic, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those feel, they're going to have like very, somewhat different but very similar architecture and yeah you know a lot of things are going to feel very similar but definitely going from california to poland is going to be a a total world changer right when i went to london a couple of years back i mean i just saw so many different things that i don't see in the states Mm -hmm. and it was unique you ever been to europe harsh no comment no comment we don't want you to dox yourself (laughs) (laughs) No, <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, you know, it's not always a bad thing that a lot of these places are not as unique as they used to be. Because let me give you an example of Nepal, okay? Or even like a lot of places in India. Like earlier, before we had globalization, these guys were literally walking 50 kilometers to go to school. And most of the kids were not actually going to school. They were uneducated. And they would make like one or two dollars a day, like doing agricultural labor or something. They, didn't, they don't want to live this life. You know, it's like now that they have the option, their kids go to an English school, they play video games, they have smartphones. So they think of it as a positive. And of course, it is a positive. So I've seen a lot of people complain that, hey, this place is entirely westernized now. It's not as unique as it used to be. Well, for the locals, they, this is what's better, right? Like They don't want to be agriculturists making $1 a month and dying of you know malaria. They want their kids to be educated. They want their kids to go to school. They want their kids to play video games and be more modern. So from the perspective of the locals, I get it. For sure. From that perspective, I 100% agree. But from the perspective, whenever I'm thinking culture, two things come to mind. Food and art. Where oh, that, that is not culture, man. Culture is beliefs and how people live, what they think. Food and right, art right. are like just... No, no, no. So food and art, what I'm talking about is from like the traveler's experience when they're coming. Uh-huh. I mean, what do most consumers do? Uh, like, let's say you're visiting to a brand new place. I, I think what we're, we're seeing the difference is you're talking about it actually from them living in the area where I could 100% see that logic where it would help if you have iPads, uh, better roads, better innovation and everything i believe when i was speaking about it i was talking about 
like me traveling somewhere. So I was taking up more of the tourist perspective rather than actually living at the place. Yeah, from Western tourist perspective, I think they want it to be as backward as it was, you know, 50, 100 years ago. I don't know about backwards. I'm talking about like, if I go there, I mean, can I see a museum where I'm like, man, I, th- there's not something like that in the US or some food where I'm thinking, and I got to come back here again, or am I just going to see another Starbucks? Oh, wait, sorry. Kyle has left a message. It seems like he's heading yeah, off. Hey, Kyle, I, 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 I need to get off, guys. Things potentially heating up here, and I just want to have an abundance of caution. So I think I need to pop out of here, unfortunately, as fun as it's been. Oh, Absolutely, right, Kyle. Where can people find you? You can find me at kyletrouble.com. I send out daily emails about becoming a sovereign and free individual. Um, and at, on Twitter at, at Kyle Trouble. And it was a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, what's your website, um, by the way? kyletrouble.com. Okay. And I appreciate you guys having me. I hope we can do this again. It has been a lot of fun. hope we can do it again um, during better times. But yeah, probably just want to play this one a little cautious off of kind of what I'm watching here on my other screen. Absolutely, Kyle. You stay safe. Uh, keep us updated yep, we'll with do. what's going on. And thank you again for joining. Yep. Thank you guys All for right, having me. Cheers. Goodbye. Try not to die. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good night. All right. Cheers.